welcome to the Vita Day Bible School or Bible study. And uh, I want to start a conversation with you today on a very important topic, namely the Holy Spirit. And um, there, are, there are a few reasons why I deem this topic very important. And I'm going to speak from two sources. The one is not very reliable and is quite subjective, and that would be my own experience. And the other source is the only reliable source, and that is the revelation of God in Scripture. Uh, I want to refer to both these, uh, the, uh, these sources just to show you why, uh, on a human level, you know, not even taking into account why Jesus said, but on a human level, why this is extremely important uh, topic. So, if you have a Bible with you, and um, you can page to it, maybe on your phone or a physical Bible, uh, I want to invite you to turn to the book of Acts, probably one of the best known verses on the Holy Spirit, apart from uh, chapter 2, chapter 1, verse 8, where Jesus told his disciples what to do to wait for the Holy Spirit and why. So you can, you can just open there if you want to, and then I want to give you a, a few thoughts on uh, how Scripture refers to the Holy Spirit. Now, uh, I, well, I grew up the way I did, and you did the way you did, of course, um, and my exposure to uh, experiencing the Holy Spirit or to teachings of the Holy Spirit uh, was in, in many aspects flawed. And, um, and the perceptions that I build and the ideas that I had concerning the person, the work and the ministry of the Holy Spirit was in many aspects just unbalanced and it was built on assumptions and uh, and observations that that did not reflect the truth of God's word so maybe in the in the process of this discussion I will you know share some of these experiences with you and uh, uh, undoubtedly you would have experiences of your own and some of them would you could probably relate with mine and say yes I know exactly what you're talking about I had a similar situation or experience so we will we will talk about that in due course but the first thing I just want to bring under your attention is how Scripture refers to the Holy Spirit. Now, that is one way. The words I just used now, the Holy Spirit. Uh, Paul used the, the, that terminology in a little bit different way. In, um, For instance, uh, Romans chapter 1 verse 4 where he speaks of the Spirit of Holiness. The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Holiness. A beautiful way of putting them, uh, the arrangement of the words, and just to, you know, tell us who we have, who we're dealing with. The Spirit of Holiness, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. Um, the Holy Spirit is also referred to, and I'm just going to just name a few. Uh, if you want, I will, I will give you a reference, but it's just a key reference. So, I mean, the, you, you could read that reference and see that, uh, you know, the name of the Holy Spirit used there. But you can also use the reference as a, as a starting point to look up all the other references. Use a cross-reference facility uh, if you have one in your Bible or on, on computer, Google or something, and you will find many, many more. Uh, Matthew 3 verse 16, uh, the Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of God. Matthew 10, verse 20, the Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of your Father. In John 14, verse 7, 17, um, the Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Truth. In Romans 1, verse 4, as I just mentioned, it, He is called the Spirit of Holiness. Romans 8, verse 2, the Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Life. 
Romans 8, 8, uh, 15 rather, 8 verse 15, the Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Adoption. Uh, I'm trying to translate from Afrikaans the uh, of adoption uh, to become children. Just, just read the English, the proper English phrase there, but that's Romans 8 verse 15. Um, Romans, uh, Ephesians 1 verse 17 speaks of the spirit of wisdom and revelation in knowledge of Him. That's a very important description of the Holy Spirit. Let me just uh, pause there for a moment. The spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. Speaking of Christ, that's a very important designation, description of the person and function of the Holy Spirit. And you will see, we will refer back to this specific designation or description rather, uh, in many different ways, as Jesus explains the person and the function and ministry of the Holy Spirit. He is also called the Spirit of Grace in Hebrews 10 verse 29, and the Spirit of Glory in 1 Peter 4 verse 14. But now, the last four descriptions of the Holy Spirit in Scripture uh, is especially important uh, for this discussion and conversation. And that is, we find it in Luke 4 verse 18, and then also in Acts chapter 5 and Acts chapter 8 verses uh, 9 and 39 respectively. And that is where the Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of the Lord. The Spirit of the Lord. don't know if you've ever come across this uh, or noticed it. Well, uh, surely you've, you've read it before, but just to notice that the writer is speaking of the Holy Spirit, calling him the Spirit of the Lord. And in, in that same, let's say, category, uh, pardon my darkened glasses, but um, I had a slight interruption and I quickly had to go outside. And when I do, my glasses color in the sun. So it will normalize just now. But uh, let us continue where we left off, uh, and that is with um, the names of the Holy Spirit given in Scripture other than the Holy Spirit. He is referred to, as I mentioned in Luke 4 verse 18, as the Spirit of the Lord. In Galatians 4 verse 6, the Holy Spirit is referred to as the Spirit of God's Son, or the Spirit of His Son, speaking of God. That's a very important thing to take notice of, as well as Romans 8 verse 9, which calls the Holy Spirit the Spirit of Christ. And then in Philippians 1 verse 19, the Holy Spirit is referred to as the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Now, there is a very important reason why the Holy Spirit is called by those names. For each one of those descriptions, there's a very important reason for. And knowing those descriptions and why the Holy Spirit is referred to as, for instance, the Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of His Son, the Spirit of Christ, and the Spirit of Jesus Christ, helps us to understand who the Holy Spirit is, what his agenda is, what his ministry is, and then, of course, also how to discern whether we have to do with the Holy Spirit or some other spirit. Now, when, when, I, when I say some other spirit, I include everything else. So it could be a spirit that is not of God, a, a demonic spirit or an unclean spirit, or just the human spirit, you know, humans are cunning and, and well, deceitful, to use biblical terms. In Jeremiah, uh, was it 17, where God says the heart of man is deceitful above all things. That is also true. And we can do certain things and then say 
it is the Holy Spirit where it is not the Holy Spirit. It's other things. Or other spirits can manifest and if we are not uh, if we are not clued up, if you will, and if we do not understand the character and person and work of the Holy Spirit, we can attribute the work or manifestations of other spirits, including humans, and say that is the work of the Spirit when it is not. So, be, uh, enable to be, uh, to be, uh, well, to, to, to discern truth from lies, crucial to understand. Now, of course, when we go to an explanation of the person and ministry of the Holy Spirit, we will definitely go to the specialist of the Holy Spirit. And the specialist in explaining the Holy Spirit is none other than Jesus Christ himself. He is brilliant in revealing the person and ministry and agenda of the Holy Spirit. Now, when we, you know, when we say that, we also acknowledge the fact that we might have in our minds certain people or certain churches or certain organizations or movements that we can deem as, you know, they are the authorities or the specialists on uh, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Be very careful uh, for that. That could be extremely dangerous. Listen, no person, no church, no movement, no whatever minister, you know, um, organization is the specialist on the Holy Spirit. The, uh, God is the specialist on the Holy Spirit. And the revealer of the character and person of the Spirit is Jesus himself. That's very important to understand. Now, we will, we will come back to this very important part of the statement uh, frequently during this conversation. Um, I just want to read to you now uh, Acts chapter 1 verse 8. The, it's a well-known, well-known quoted verse in, in, well, definitely in certain circles um, uh, of the Christian church. So this is where, uh, let's start with, let's start with verse 6. We give it a sort of a, um, you know, just a, a introduction. <laughs> Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. So they ask him a specific question. Jesus answers them unsatisfactorily, I think, what, what they are concerned. They wanted to know when, and he said, it's not for you to know. Then Jesus starts something else that is more important than the question they asked. Uh, and, and incidentally, the answer, what Jesus now uh, offers to the disciples, is in, in, it is actually an answer to their question, but on a totally different level than they're expecting. So they, they're, getting, they're not getting what they're expecting. And Jesus changes the subject, but in actual fact, in the, in the center of it, he is answering them, but on a totally different level. He's, he's telling them things about the agenda of God and the kingdom of God that he wants them to know. Now, these are the words that are so well known um, to many believers. But you shall receive power. Now, let me just stop there. When people cite this verse, uh, they, they might read the entire verse, but they could have just, you know, stopped at this phrase, for them, this is what this verse is about. You shall receive power. And so they will preach that. So they will read maybe the whole verse, but, you know, then expand on the power you will receive power and power and then they will elaborate on uh, on something that is of their own doing and their own understanding and uh, and their own emphasis that has got nothing to do with this verse uh, you know so people will be asked do you want power yes you see jesus said you will receive power 
That is not the emphasis of the verse, even though it might seem so to many. You will receive power. No, no, wait, wait, wait. That's not the complete verse. For, for many people, power is volume. You know, if they want to exhibit power or just prove that they have the power of the Holy Spirit, they will shout and speak loudly and use amplifiers and volume is equated to the power of the Holy Spirit. And of course, then also manifestations. There has to be manifestations and that would be power. And you see, Jesus said, the Holy Spirit will bring power. But wait, wait, wait. That's not the emphasis of the verse. So he said, you will uh, receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses. So I've read an article a few weeks ago where a person would use, he, he wrote an article on Pentecostalism and he used about, let's say, 400 words. Uh, the same, more or less, the same amount of words that, uh, that was used to uh, record Peter's sermon in Acts chapter 2. It's also more or less 400, 450 words thereabouts, depending on the, on the translation you're using or the version of the Bible you're using. More or less the, the same uh, amount of words. And, and then in his article, he came to this verse and said, you see, we will receive power to be witnesses. So, well, well, um, let's just give it to him. He, he progressed a little bit further than the power emphasis. You will receive power to be witnesses. And, uh, uh, and then, you know, continue to talk about evangelism and so on. But, but you cannot stop there. You cannot place the emphasis on witnesses. You receive power to be witnesses because that too is not what the verse is saying. You'll see now. It, it may seem that I'm quite pedantic about, you know, the words and it's, a, it's rather a play on words, but it's not. In actual fact, it changes the meaning and understanding and perspective radically, depending on where you put the emphasis of this verse. You could say, yes, but the emphasis is on the Holy Spirit. Yes, it is, depending on what you mean by that. But, but let me just finish my train of thought. So the emphasis is not that you will receive power. The emphasis is also not that you will receive power to be witnesses. <laughs> Here is the emphasis. I'll read you the complete verse. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. So the source of whatever Jesus is talking about now, the source will be the Holy Spirit. And you shall be witnesses to me. Oh, and maybe you don't recognize it immediately. But this is extremely important to understand. The ministry of the Holy Spirit has everything to do with Jesus Christ. Everything. Maybe you and I, maybe by hearing this, we might think, oh yes, we know what everything means. That the ministry of the Holy Spirit has everything to do with the Holy Spirit. But I can almost guarantee you 100% that in most cases it's not true. We don't understand. The reason for the power has to do has everything to do with Jesus. The reason for power to be witnesses has everything to do with Jesus. It's not to merely receive power. It's not to merely be witnesses. Witnesses of what? Many people, many people have become witnesses of their church or you know their movement. That is not the calling of God in your life. You, the calling is not to be a representative and a witness of your church or your movement. It is to be a witness. In, in, in The wording here is the witnesses to me, meaning they are witnessing about Christ. 
in society it's all about Christ that's why the Holy Spirit is also referred to as the Spirit of Christ the Spirit of Jesus Christ the Spirit of his Son or the Spirit of the Lord you will see as we progress in this discussion and when we go and look at Jesus explanation that the Holy Spirit has only one agenda his agenda is not to give you power or me his agenda is not merely to give us power to be witnesses his agenda is to empower us to be witnesses of Jesus Christ listen speaking of nuances not witnesses of the Holy Spirit <laughs> the emphasis is always placed on Christ why is the emphasis placed on Christ because he is everything now I can just imagine when you move into a part of the world where spiritism is a very real and you know um, a current thing you know let's say let's be I'm, I'm from Africa so let's say if you move into Africa into parts where where demon worship or ancestral worship or spiritism in all its forms is a very real thing with witch doctors and you know all those things uh, then even in, in those areas it is a very dangerous thing to think that the Holy Spirit is just one other spirit that manifests power and that he will manifest power to show that he's got power bigger than demons even that train of thought can lead you uh, you know into the wild the Holy Spirit has one agenda and that agenda is to glorify Christ and to emphasize Christ and to reveal Christ everything the Holy Spirit does places the emphasis 100% on Jesus Christ the beloved Son of God never on himself that was part of Jesus explanation we will we will see that just a bit later in this discussion so you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and and to the end of the earth why why do you need power to be witnesses of Christ why do you need power that's a good question and you know depending on where you live this is maybe a, st a strange statement depending on where you live would in a large extent determine your answer give you an example if you live in an area where people who believe in Jesus as the beloved of God people who believe that Jesus is who he said he is the only truth the way and the life and and in that area they those people those believing in Christ submitting to him is severely persecuted in the most cruel ways thinkable from a character accession, accession, assassination to murder and torture and depravity of all kinds and you are there then it's very easy to understand why the Holy Spirit will empower you to be witnesses of Christ you see it's, it's a build up it's power to be witnesses of Christ and there is the emphasis you know Jesus speaking to the disciples they lived in at the time was the absolute uh, capital of hatred against Jesus Christ and that was Jerusalem 50 days more or less prior to this conversation Jesus was executed publicly executed by by crucifixion he was uh, unjustly um, uh, sentenced in an unjust court he was tortured he was publicly humiliated and then brutally murdered the the effect it had on people undoubtedly 
must have had a huge, huge traumatic impact on their lives. Now, when you are called to be witnesses of Jesus Christ in a place where he is hated like that, you cannot go in there with, you know, just by being brave. You need something much more than bravery to be a witness of Christ in such an environment. And for those of you who might be viewing this video, who might be living in areas like that, will exactly know what I'm saying. If you're living in a, a much more free environment, a rich environment where all the people who live there have everything they have, uh, you know, and everything is about having more and being successful, then then you would probably answer this question differently in why do you need power to be witnesses of Jesus Christ? You might answer it differently. Maybe you say, because we need power uh, to, to manifest the kingdom of God in power, like Paul said, so that your faith will not be merely in the words of human wisdom, but in the power of God. And that is true. But a word of caution. Never talk about the power of God. Never talk about the manifestation of the Holy Spirit or any of those topics outside of the revelation of Jesus Christ. Because everything that God does he does with Jesus right in the center of it. The glorification of His Son, revealing His Son, emphasizing His Son, for the joy of His Son, the glory of His Son. Everything is about the Son. And when Jesus explained the Holy Spirit, he, he always explained the Spirit in context of Himself, not as I perceived it many years ago, well, since a little boy. You know, Jesus and the Holy Spirit were two separate chapters in my mind. You know, you would hear the Gospel. Uh, usually it had to do with the love of God and the saving grace of God and that I just have to receive Jesus, give Him my life, give him my heart, you know, put up my hand in the service. Do you want to receive Jesus as your Savior? And then, all right, so let's say I put up my hand. They take notice of me. They would say, I see that hand. And, and usually, you know, call you forward and then pray with you. And maybe take you to the back room or backstage and fill in a card with your address on it. All right, now you have prayed the sinner's prayer. Now you gave your life to Christ. All right, so that's done and dusted. That's now finished. So uh, that is Jesus, uh, the beginning and the end of Jesus right there. Now, the next chapter has to do with the Holy Spirit. And, uh, and well, when I was a boy, the perception of the weird and wonderful world of the Holy Spirit. And people will come and preach, and then it's all about knowing the Holy Spirit and functioning in the Holy Spirit and living in the Holy Spirit, and then it's the Spirit and manifestations of the Spirit. So, I mean, you couldn't really blame me that my perception was this, the two chapters. I finished with Jesus, I gave my life to Him. Okay, done and dusted, thank you. Now I'm proclaimed as a child of God and pronounced, you are now a child of God, welcomed in the family, and now I continue with the Holy Spirit. When I read scripture, I never get that distinction there, anyway, anywhere. I can understand how it can creep in if you're not careful. If you're reading Acts, for example, you could, you know, I mean, I can understand that, that you would, if you're not careful, would go from Luke, let's say, written by Luke, the Gospel of Luke, which all about Jesus, and then progress to Acts, the second book written by Luke, and now everything is about the Holy Spirit. But that, that impression you can only get if you are not careful. And I can understand that. But if you look carefully, you will see that is not a message and an impression found in Scripture that throughout Scripture, not only the Gospel of Luke or the book of Acts, but starting from Genesis, 
Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 right through to Revelation chapter 22 verse last that everything is about Jesus Christ knowing Him and obeying Him. Then, you know, as we understand that, we see that Scripture even reveals that it was long before Genesis chapter 1 verse 1, it was even before creation was created, where Jesus was the absolute focus of the Father, and everything the Father did, or everything the Father said, had His Son as the center of that. The reason why God created creation was for His Son. The way He created creation was through the Son. And then we also read that the Son maintains everything and holds it together. And repeatedly in Scripture it is said, so that Christ can be first in everything. So we read it in various places in the New Testament, the absolute revelation that it is, it's not about you and me primarily. It is first and foremost about Jesus, the beloved Son of God. And everything finds meaning in Christ and everything is culminated in Christ. That's why he's called the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He's everything. And, and you know, in the West it is so easy, especially if you had an upbringing like mine, which was, which was devoutly Christian. And uh, and, and heavily influenced by the Pentecostal and charismatic movement and evangelicals. And, you know, I'm so grateful for my heritage and the things that I've learned, but I also recognized there were a lot of things that I learned that I had to unlearn. So if you have to unlearn it, why learn it in the first place? That's the question. But there were many things that I learned uh, thinking that it was the absolute gospel, to later find, uh, find out it wasn't the gospel. It was just baggage. And that is so difficult to distinguish between, you know, the truth, truth, and the so-called truth. And, uh, and it is still an ongoing process. What we want to know and understand is the truth, truth, the truth of God as he explains it, and God does not affiliate with a church organization, a mission organization, or a denomination. And by that, I'm not saying I'm against those, I'm just saying God is not part of them. He doesn't affiliate with them, he doesn't have membership in your church or mine. He is God of all, he is exalted above everything and everything else, everything and everyone. And we want to understand God, not through the lenses of our experiences or the lenses of our church or cell group or home group or denomination. How wonderful and dear they might be. We want to understand God as God explains it. He and only He is the authority on Himself. You and I are not the authorities on God, and neither are the churches where we affiliate or attain. God is. And when it gets to this uh, important topic of the Holy Spirit, we need to understand, we, you know, we need to understand what God is saying and why He is saying it and ex understand it exactly so that we can measure what we think we know against what He says if you cannot distinguish what he says, how do you measure? How do you judge that what you think the Holy Spirit is, is in actual fact truly the Holy Spirit? You see? So God is the standard. God who is not a Pentecostal. God who is not a Charismatic or a Baptist or an Evangelical or Reformed or anything else. God who is God, the Lord of the universe. So we need to know what does he say. And he says, 
when he speaks, he says, he says, there are only two things you need to know. I'm thinking, two things? <laughs> Maybe you're asking, where does it say in the Bible there are only two things you need to know? No, it doesn't say anything like that anywhere. But let me tell you what is there. Let me remind you about this. When God had an opportunity to speak to Peter, James and John, He could have told them anything. He could have thrown the book at them. He knows everything. He understands everything clearly. He does not make assumptions. He is not presumptuous. He hasn't got theories. He is the source of everything. And then he had this opportunity with these three disciples in the presence of Jesus Christ. And then God says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. I want to tell you, the rest of this discussion on the Holy Spirit will emphasize this fact. What did God mean when he said that Jesus is everything? that He is the Alpha and Omega. What does it really mean? And when we're talking about the Holy Spirit, how does it apply? How does it, how is it explained? How do we understand the person and ministry of the Holy Spirit? Apart from all the things we think we have experienced and saw and heard, how, we, how do we hear what God is saying about what He says the focus is, and then look at the Holy Spirit and then put it all into context. How does that happen? And that is the next part of this discussion. And I want to uh, just give you a heads up in advance. In the next video about this topic, we are going to look at uh, John chapter 16. So you can read it so long for yourself. John chapter 16, you can start reading from about verse 7. Uh, uh, our portion we're going to look at focus uh, focuses on the verses 8 to 14. Um, uh, well, thinking of it, start, start from uh, John 16 verse 1. You could start earlier, you could start in verse, uh, chapter 13, where the conversation that Jesus had with his disciples started, chapter 13, 14, 15, and 16, and they build onto one another. And the, the end of that conversation happens in chapter 17, where Jesus finishes the conversation with a prayer, praying the, the high, priest, high priestly prayer, um, and then moving out to Gethsemane, where he was arrested. So chapter 16, if you can, before you watch the next video, just read it. Start from verse 1, see what Jesus has to say about persecution, and then follow his train of thought as you approach verse 18 to 14, the, the explanation of the person and ministry of the Holy Spirit, and see if you can pick up what the key elements are, according to Jesus' explanation, of the ministry and the work and the agenda of the Holy Spirit. See you in the next video.